Hi, I'm Jeff Provine, and I'm here to talk about stories. Our topic for episode one are the three parts of a story. So every story ever told has these th same three parts. One, a character, somebody that the viewpoint can be carried through. Two, a plot, a series of events that is happening to this character as he or she pursues her goal. And three, a setting. This is where the story happens. Every story's got this. It uh, doesn't matter if it's a movie or a book or a play, everything. It's all got it. Character, plot, and setting. Those are three parts to a story. I could tell you a story right now about the time that I wanted to have some cereal for breakfast. But when I got to the fridge, there was no milk. So I went to the grocery store, got some milk, came home, and had my breakfast. The end. Well, that's a story. It's not a great story, but it is technically a story with the three main parts. You've got a character, me. You've got a plot. I want to have breakfast, but I don't have any milk. And three, a setting. So, both in the kitchen as well as in the grocery store. It's not a very good story, but we can make it a little bit more interesting by livening it up through the story question. A story question is the concept of taking the plot and turning it on its head. So rather than, with a premise, giving a description, we ask a question. So if you're in a zombie movie, the story question is, will the humans be able to get away from the zombies? Uh, if you're in a fairy tale, the question is, will Little Red Riding Hood be able to get to her grandmother's with the goodies? Will Superman be able to save Metropolis by punching a meteorite in time? Using a story question is a great way to keep your story focused while you write. You don't want to get off track, and if you're not answering the story question or adding some conflict to it, you're getting off track. Going back to my own story, we could make it a little bit more interesting by maybe adding some antagonists. So. What if I got to the grocery store and it was currently being robbed by ninjas? So, to get to the milk, I have to fight my way through these ninjas and then be able to fight my way back to the register, get the milk, and then I can go home and have breakfast. It's a little bit more exciting of a story. We can make the story a little tragic, too, by, instead of ninjas, I get to the grocery store and find out that there's only one jug of milk left, and it's between me and a single mother who's got three starving kids. So, I'll have to fight all of them off to be able to get the milk back to the register and then get home. Or maybe, when I get the milk and get home, I realize too late that I'm in fact lactose intolerant. So we have a story. Possibly not the greatest story ever told, but it does its job. It has the three com components, and the cool thing about stories are they blossom in any possible way. Every single one's going to be a little bit different. Even if we get an infinite number of different stories, they're all still going to need those same three key components. Character, plot, and setting. So to illustrate these three points, we're going to talk about The Iliad by Homer. This is a story 3,000 years old, and there is a reason it's still being told. When most people talk about The Iliad, they ask what it's about. And people will say, oh, it's the Trojan War. But that's not entirely accurate. The Trojan War was a huge event taking place over 10 years. I'd be kind of like somebody saying, you know, what's your book about? And you say, World War II. Well, what about World War II? A lot happened. Just like that, the Iliad isn't about the Trojan War. It actually takes place over the course of about a week, maybe two weeks at most. So it's the story of this guy named Achilles and how he got his groove back. The Iliad starts with a plague in the Greek camp. So they've been besieging Troy for years now, and everything's been going pretty well until recently when it gets real bad. Thousands are sick, hundreds are dying, and the Greek kings get together to see what they can do about it. During the meeting, a uh, prophet of Apollo comes in. It turns out they had recently raided a temple of Apollo, which everybody was pretty proud of, but Apollo didn't like them kidnapping the priestesses, especially the head priest's daughter. So to stop the plague, all they have to do is turn over the head priest's daughter. The problem with this is that Agamemnon, the head of the Greek kings, uh, kept her as his war bride. So, Achilles steps up, and he's a pretty awesome guy. Everybody loves Achilles. He's a bit of a weirdo, which happens when your mother's immortal, uh, and very, very overprotective. She dipped him in the river Styx so that he was immortal except for his heel. Don't spread that around too much. But if you're invulnerable, a really good strategy for your career is to get involved in warfare. It's kind of hard to want to fight somebody that can kill you, but you can't kill him. So Achilles gives a big speech about how true leaders sacrifice for their men and everybody's applauding it and thinking it's really cool. Agamemnon's pretty put out, so he counters with, well, I'll give up my war bride, and I'll take yours instead. And since you're such a great leader, you'll be totally okay with sacrificing for the greater good, right? 
So Achilles is done at this point. Uh, he pulls out his sword, getting ready to kill this guy for dishonoring him like this, embarrassing him in front of everybody. Uh, but then the goddess Athena shows up, and she says, Ho, ho, don't kill him. I've got some plans. It's, something better is going to happen. So Achilles is in a real tight spot. He can't kill this guy to get his honor back, and he can't really do much of anything else. So he's got to figure out some other way. Instead, uh, he decides to quit. Uh, he and his soldiers, the Mimerdians, are done. Uh, they're going to take their ball and go home. Achilles also gives one of the best insults in all of literary history. He calls Agamemnon a old sack of wine. So the only thing good he's doing is, is holding wine, and he's not even good at that because he's going to break. Hilarious. So the next day, everybody goes out to battle, and the Trojans realize that Achilles isn't here. And they're like, hey, that guy we can't kill. He's not trying to kill us. Let's go kill everybody else. So they charge. The Greeks are panicking. They get kicked all the way back to their camp. Uh, so bad that the high prince of Troy, Hector, he can touch one of the ships. So the battle goes so poorly that eventually the, the Trojans do have to retreat, uh, helped out by the gods a little bit. And it turns out that you can't get your honor back by just walking out. Uh, mic dropping uh, is cool, but deep down you're not going to feel fulfilled. So instead, uh, Achilles' buddy Patroclus comes up with a new idea. He says, hey, I know you've got these problems with honor, and I want to make sure that yours is defended, but we've also got to fight the Trojans. So what we can do is I'll wear your armor, pretend to be you, and then I'll go fight the Trojans. And Achilles is like, that's stupid. And Patroclus is like, come on, come on, it'll be all right. And Achilles says, okay, fine, we'll do this. So the problem is it's not honorable to get your buddies to fight your battles for you either. And Patroclus finds out this the hard way when the next day they go out to battle. Hector finds him, thinks he's going to kill Achilles, and instead kills Patroclus. And Achilles finds out that his good buddy has died on his behalf. After some serious man crying, Achilles decides there's going to be another way that he's going to get his honor back. Vengeance. Achilles rushes out to war, finds Hector, chases him around the battlefield, chases him around the entire city multiple times, over and over again. Until finally, uh, Hector gets tricked by the gods, he stops, Achilles kills him, and then he doesn't feel better. Uh, it, it didn't work. He still kind of feels like a doofus. So he decides, well, maybe it's just not enough. So he drags Hector's corpse back to the camp, and the next day, attaches it to his chariot, rides it around the city. you beating it, yelling at it, cursing the Trojans. It's hilarious. At least it is for Achilles at the time. But every time he's done with it, it still it doesn't feel good. He's still not honorable. One day, after a busy time of corpse beating and Trojan cursing, Achilles is there, man crying in his tent, uh, when suddenly the tent flap opens, and in walks Priam, the king of the Trojans. So he's this little old man, and Achilles is a big, strong warrior guy. All he has to do is grab this old guy, hold him for ransom. The Trojans have to open the gates. War over. Achilles would be the greatest hero that there's ever been. But... Achilles knows honor, and it's not honorable to kill your guests. So Achilles says, hey old man, what's going on? And Priam says, listen, I'm not here as king of the Trojans. I'm here as Hector's dad. Uh, I've watched you take his body and parade it around the city, beating it, cursing at it, and I can't, I can't take it anymore. Look, I'm just a dad, and I just want to take my boy home and bury him. And I, I can't really offer you anything but would you let me? And Achilles thinks about it, and he says, okay. And he feels better, because it's honorable to help people that can do nothing in return for you. Uh, you set yourself on a whole higher station. And that's the story of the Iliad. It's, it's all this lesson of what is it that truly is honorable as you go through your young life. It's a good story. There's a reason it's been around for 3,000 years. But it's not the only story. People are writing stories every day. And who knows? Yours might be the next one that lasts 3,000 years. But to do so, you're going to have to pay attention to those three parts of a story. Character, plot, and setting. If you want to work on character, plot, and setting a little bit more, uh, check out episode 1.1. Uh, we've got some worksheets and some examples, and you can figure out some ways to come up with great ideas for your next great story. This episode's anthology I was in is Literati Presents Building a Better Tomorrow. Literati Press is an Oklahoma City publishing house founded to take, as they like to say, a stand for change. We're on the front lines of America's culture war. We are the forward advance. 
Literary Press hosts a great amalgamation of comics, short fiction, long fiction, everything that's awesome. Presents Number One collects tales of utopia and dystopia, from feel good stories of family coming together to people being eaten by giant ants. My story, The Greater Good, shows a world where everything you do is calculated as to how much it contributes to society and what happens when you rebel by doing nothing. Check out Literati Press in the info below and leave a shout out in the comments. Till next time, writers, keep writing.